Good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, uh, I'm a postdoc in Krishna Magalhães group. So today I talk about Nandri's proxy as a generic route to traveling and oscillatory state. In other words, what happens if Newton's third law is effectively broken? So this is a collective work be uh, between myself, Apana uh, Baskaran, uh, Somaya uh, Sokri, Fernando Capri, and Krishna Magalhães. So First of all, please allow me to introduce a prototype of perpetual motion machine to you, like this. So the idea is that the first magnet can attract the second one, and this can prepare the whole car and take you to infinity and beyond. But we all know that this is not possible, and precisely because of Newton's third law, which states that the interaction between any two objects have the same magnitude but different uh, directions, object direction actually. So all internal forces should cancel out and the car can never move unless there is an application of external forces. Okay. So Newton's third law lies at the core of physics. Uh, for example, it uh, allows us to study the, the uh, motion of compli complicated objects by ignoring all internal forces. An example is to study the orbiting of the sun, of this uh, Earth around the sun, we can just treat it as a point particle. We don't need to worry about how six billion people move on Earth. The third law also guarantees the conservation of momentum. So uh, it's also the basis of statistical mechanics as well as uh, continuum mechanics. For example, in continuum mechanics, a key concept is the stress. And the stress can only be defined if the mechanical interaction between the two sides of any interface is reciprocal, okay? So considering that this importance of the third law, one might ask, uh, will, can the third law be violated? And if so, what can happen? So a quick answer to the first question is yes and no. On the one hand, uh, at a microscopy level, the third law is always valid because it's guaranteed uh, by the translational environments of physical law. However, in an equilibrium environment, the effective interaction between objects can be non reciprocal. And a good example is the predator prey system. Here, the zebra is trying to escape from the line, so it's effectively repaired by this line. While the line is trying to, escape, uh, to catch this zebra, so it's effectively attracted by this zebra. Altogether, the line, the zebra, and the ground, of course, satisfy Newton's third law. However, if we only look at the line zebra subsystem, we can see that the interaction between the two objects is non reciprocal. Another example is this by putting this shark in the square of phase, you can see that non reciprocal interaction can give rise to these interesting, interesting dynamics of the phase school. Non reciprocal interaction has also been found in cellular systems. For example, here, that uh, purple cell is attracted by green cells through chemotaxis, while the green cells are repaired by the purple cell through mechanical interaction. So effectively, the interaction looks very similar to this predator prey system. This type of interaction can also be engineered in synthetic systems. For example, uh, a recent uh, work demonstrated that if you put two specific types of colloids uh, close together, then spontaneous flow can be generated inside these job disk. And this can prepare the blue particle to go away from the right one and the red particle to chase this blue particle. And in a uh, system like the robotic system, this kind of interaction can be uh, more easier to arrange because you can just program the machine and it can do anything you want. And finally, this kind of interaction is also inherent in social system. For example, this guy, he has about 300,000 followers, but he only follows two people, okay? So these results indicate that indeed, in an equilibrium environment, this non-zeritical interaction can emerge effectively when you look at just some subsystem of the whole system, okay? So the next question is, what can happen in such systems? So today I'll show you one simple example. So for simplicity and to highlight the effect of this non reciprocity, we're going to use a very simple um, phase field model of Cantilever fields. Okay. 
So here, the phase field phi can characterize the local concentration of a particle or other other parameters that we can concern about. And the Gandhi equation for this phi is the Cantilla equation, which is a realization of the phi four theory. Okay. So essentially, chi here can controls the phase transition or phase separation of the system, such that for a positive chi, the steady state of the system is homogeneous. And for sufficiently negative chi, the system spontaneous phase separate or demix into a region of high and low concentration. So that's the base system. And to introduce non-reciprocity, we're going to create another field. And we refer to the two fields as phi A and phi B. And for simplicity, we just use, uh, set this phi B to be subcritical. Okay, and we ignore all the linear terms and high gradient terms. But if, of course, you can include all these, and that doesn't change the dynamics um, qualitatively. Okay, so phi B now just uh, is effectively uh, diffusion, uh, has a diffusive dynamics. So now let's introduce non-reciprocal interaction. Okay, this is done by introducing this uh, cross diffusion between the two species, with the cross diffusive uh, coefficient kappa A B and kappa B A. So the cross diffusion effectively kind of describes the effect that in presence of a gradient of one species, the other species will uh, generate a, a current in response to that. For example, if you have a gradient of species B, which are blue particles like this, then this species A will either uh, react, like it will go towards the gradient if kappa AB is positive. So this can mimic an effective repulsive interaction from species B. On the other hand, if uh, kappa AB is negative, then A will go against the gradient as if it's attracted by species B. So then this property is introduced through by setting kappa AB and kappa BA as the difference and sum of these two constants, kappa and delta. So if delta is zero, then kappa AB is identical to kappa BA and the interaction is reciprocal. At very last uh, delta, we see that um, they have, if say if delta is much larger than kappa, then the two coefficients have uh, of this sign. So this, the dynamics, the interaction between the two is purely uh, non-reciprocal. So delta versus kappa then controls the degree of non-reciprocity. Sure. So since I don't know these systems very well, can you give some, understanding of why we want to put this non-reciprocity in the diffusive term instead of just a direct, you know, attractive attractive interaction or something where they both move together without thinking about the fluctuations. Uh, sorry, I don't quite get the question. Can you repeat? Well, so for example, if you go to your, your example of the predator prey, mm. it's not that the lion runs here and the, I don't know, zebra diffuses downstream. The zebra just runs away. It's, it's a lower order term. Yeah, yeah. Is, is there a reason why you want to put it in the diffusion term rather than some lower order term in the dynamics? Uh, we are considering these diffusive fears, so that most that's the most nature. Okay, so it's because this is a diffusive model. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Is it also related to the fact that these uh, phases are uh, conserved? There is some conservation. In terms of the, uh, it appears that phi A and phi B are uh, individually uh, conserved, right? Yeah, both fields are conserved. Okay. Yeah. So the only coupling is the coupling in terms of this um, diffusion coupling. You cannot have any, if yeah. you want to respect conservation, you cannot have. Yes, any. exactly. That's a very good point. Yes, conservation is very important. We want to, to have some dynamics in a, such a conservative system to highlight the effect of the energy property. Yeah. Okay, so finally, we, we are set kappa to be positive, such that uh, without energy property, the two, uh, the two fields will repair each other, so they, they don't like each other if you like. Okay, so now let's see what this model can do. So we are first do numerical simulation of this coupled equation in a square periodic box, starting from a homogeneous uh, zero concentration. Okay, and this plot shows the state diagram spanned by chi A which controls the phase separation and the non-reciprocity that have versus kappa. 
a weak uh, a small chi a, of course we have a homogeneous state, so nothing happens. Increasing chi a leads the two spheres to phase separate, and depend particularly at small energy positive, we have a static demic state eventually. So this kind of static state is typical in diffusion system because I mean, I mean it's it's a system where uh, dissipation dominates and all dynamics in such system will eventually die out. Now let's crank up uh, non-reciprocity. reciprocity. Okay. So we are very surprised to find that when non reciprocity becomes large enough, this, this kind of static state becomes unstable and the system develops either into a uh, oscillatory state or traveling state. So first there is a self-sustained oscillation while the two spheres that was oscillating in, in space and time. So this is basically a, a standing wave, if you like. Okay. Then there's also a traveling state at which um, the both spheres are going towards the same direction at a constant speed. Such kind of uh, time periodic states are quite common in reaction diffusion systems. However, there, one usually need a refract, uh, reaction term in order to sustain this kind of time periodic behavior. So the emergence of time, such time behavior, uh, time periodic behavior in a purely diffusive system is very, very counterintuitive. And it, it sig signals the emergence of new physics invoked by this non reciprocity. Okay. So now let's see what's responsible for this time dependent behavior. Okay. To do that, we need to go back to the original um, governing equation and pinpoint the effect of non reciprocity. For, for simplicity, we're going to assume that only the lowest Fourier mode is activated. Okay. Under such a uh, one mode approximation, the two spheres can be written as two harmonic functions with a amplitude rho and a phase theta. So phase indicate the position, the spatial position of this maximum of the field. Okay. Under such setting, the oscillatory state, which is a standing wave, then has a fixed phase, but with an amplitude that is periodically evolving in time. Similarly, the traveling state should have a fixed row, but the phase is linearly, will linearly increase with time, and V here is the velocity. Okay. So by substituting this uh, enzymes into the o, uh, PDE, we get a coupled ODE that governs the amplitude and phase of the two fields. Here, for uh, instead of writing equation for theta A and theta B, we write uh, the equation for their sum and their difference. This is because by doing so, you see that this phi, the total total phase, does not appear on the right hand side. So we practically have only three degrees of freedom. Okay. So we are we are first try to solve the steady state of this uh, steady state solution of this ODE, and then by looking at the stability analysis, we're going to find out what's responsible for this time period behavior. So now let's first find out. What's the steady state? Okay, this is done by setting the first three equations to be zero. Here, the uh, capital phi is laid by the other. So once we know the first three quantities, the dynamics of phi is already known. Okay, so the first solution will be easy. It's just the trivial state, where both row A and row B are zero. So this corresponds to the homogeneous state in the system. To find a second fixed point or second steady state, we're going to set sine theta to be zero. This gives theta equals zero or pi. Okay. Substitute theta into the first two equations, we get a second steady state, which corresponds to the static mix, the mixed state. Okay. To find the third fixed point, we're going to set the prefactor of sine theta to be zero. Okay. And together with the first two equations, we get a third fixed point that corresponds to the traveling state. So how do we know that this is the traveling state? Okay, we can substitute this equation into here. We see that the total phase, the time derivative of the total phase, it, which is equivalent to the summation of the two velocities, is non-zero. So this is the traveling state. Okay. So by doing stability analysis of the homogeneous state and the static state, with the as not show the details here, but we can show that um, 
the theoretical prediction of the phase boundary correspond or agrees very nicely with the simulation of the original PDE. Okay. So um, now let me stress here that uh, the phases that you have to this time periodic stage lies on the stability of this static state. Okay. So in other words, how the system across this line, this black line here. And that's what I'm going to show now. Okay. First of all, let's see how Landry's proxy can induce this traveling state. Okay. We start from this demix, uh, static, static uh, demix state. We see that the, the phase difference is pi. Okay. So the configuration of two spheres are out of phase, meaning that the maximum of one phase always corresponds to the minimum of the other. This is because at non low language porosity, the two spheres have a mutual repulsion, so they hate each other, and that's why they have this kind of out of phase configuration. And one can see that this configuration has a refraction symmetry because the two spheres have both have refraction acts here and here. Okay. Now let's add a small perturbation in the phase of phi, by moving this phi a forward. Okay. This breaks the refraction symmetry. And let's see how the two spheres would respond to that. We can easily write down the uh, velocity of the two spheres that is equal to the rate of change of theta a and theta b. Okay. Now, since kappa a b is always positive, so v b will go forward to chase b, uh, so b will chase a. Okay. If kappa a b is also positive, now that there is a negative sign here, a will actually go backward. Okay. So together, they will uh, go to towards each other and this eliminate this uh, phase perturbation and restore the refraction symmetry. So the static state is actually stable in such case. Now, if kappa AB is negative, then VA will be positive. So A try to escape from B. However, if VA is still smaller than VB, then B can still catch up with A, uh, eliminate this phase uh, perturbation and restore the symmetry. So the static state is also stable in such case. The interesting case is when VA becomes larger than VB. Okay. In this case, A will keep going forward, but B cannot change it. So this perturbation will keep increasing in time. And this permanently breaks the refraction symmetry and makes the, this static state unstable. Eventually, the system will go to a traveling state. In such state, um, B will try to catch up with A while A try to escape from B. Looks very much like this donkey chasing a carrot. Okay. So this is actually a perpetual motion machine that might work. Okay. So uh, to understand better or more intuitively what's happening here, we're going to do a sim simulation of a binary mixture of Brownian particles. Okay. So we have a particle species A and species B. Now they <clears throat> We set the interaction between species A to be attractive to enforce phase separation as we have in the continuum theory. We set the interaction between species B to be repulsive such that it has diffusive dynamics. Again, as we have in the, uh, in the continuum theory. Now we introduce the angelical interaction such that B is repelled by A and A is attracted by B. Okay. So, uh, all these forces are just uh, linear forces. And the uh, dangerous proxy can, can be controlled by this KAB here. Here we have negative KAB, here we have KAB. So KAB controls the degree of dangerous proxy. Okay. So, that, so we do the simulation. So the simulation is done by starting from a configuration like this. So we set a block or a region of species A in the middle and then just randomly place particle, this blue particle on the two sides. As small energy proxy, we see only diffusive dynamics. So that everything is just diffusive. There is no net uh, flow in the system. And the system has a refraction symmetry about the center of this red domain. Okay. As strong energy proxy, we see that the system starts to experience a parity breaking. And then it leads to a traveling state where both spheres are traveling at the same direction. So to understand this kind of symmetry breaking that is to the traveling state, we're going to use this example. Okay. So now, since species B, uh, A 
so the red particle are attracted by these blue, blue particles. If the blue particles are symmetrically distributed about on the two sides, then the attraction, attraction force will be even. So the red domain will be still, or at least it will only diffuse. Okay. Now, fluctuation can always make the di distribution slightly um, uneven on the two sides. Okay. So now the attraction force on the right side will be slightly larger than the left one. Okay. So the red one would go move towards right. And now since the blue particle is repaired by, by this red one, okay, this motion displacement of red domain will compress the region of blue particles and make the denser region even denser. Okay. So this makes the attractive force even more asymmetric. So eventually, a positive feedback loop is formed by this um, uh, density, uh, this uh, density uh, asymmetry and the force asymmetry keep feed each other, and then this permanently breaks the parity and leads to the traveling state. And this is why Landry's property can induce this uh, traveling state through this parity breaking. Okay, now I briefly introduced how non reciprocity can also give rise to this oscillatory state. Okay, we again start from the stability of this static dimic state, like here. The governing equation of the phase and theta are like this. Okay, so we know that this uh, oscillatory state corresponds to a standing wave. So the phase difference is actually locked at pi. So sub substitute theta into this, we get uh, two simple equations couple equation for the amplitudes, okay? Setting them to zero, we get the steady state, which corresponds to the static dimic state as here, okay? Now we're going to study the stability of this uh, static state in, in amplitudes, okay? So to do that, we're going to add a small perturbation to this uh, steady state, and then substitute to the equation, we get an, a governing equation for the perturbation. Okay, so M here controls the linear, uh, linear behavior of this perturbation. And particularly the eigenvalue of M controls whether or not this perturbation will grow or decay. So this plot shows how the maximum eigenvalue of M uh, changes with non reciprocity. We see that as weak non reciprocity, the eigenvalue is negative. So the perturbation will decay expensively in time. So this uh, static state is always stable. Now, increase the reciprocity, we see that the uh, complex, the imaginary part of this eigenvalue become non-zero, okay? So this means that the, the perturbation will not only decay or grow in time, but they also oscillate in time periodically, okay? Now, when we have enough, high enough non reciprocity, we see that this red line, which is the rear part of the uh, eigenvalue, become positive, so this the, so the static, static state become um, unstable. And we see this correspond to a non-zero imaginary part, okay? So this means that the perturbation will not only grow expensively in time, but it also oscillate. So this kind of, um, uh, this kind of instability is usually referred to as half bifurcation, okay? It, it breaks the time translational symmetry and give rise to a self-sustained oscillation. And we see that this hop bifurcation is only possible when there is a non-zero imaginary part. And this non-zero imaginary part only exists because of non-reciprocity, okay? So to summarize, non-reciprocity can destabilize the static state through a hop bifurcation, which breaks the time translation symmetry and leads to a self-sustained oscillation. So to conclude, non-reciprocity can drive various interesting time periodic state, even in a purely diffusive systems. And these, these kind of behavior originate from the various type of spontaneous symmetry breaking induced by non-reciprocity. Okay. Since uh, this non-reciprocity interaction uh, can happen in, can appear in this uh, non-equilibrium non environment, this study might be relevant to a uh, time periodic state in synthetic biological and social systems. In, in a broader perspective, okay, non reciprocity can also uh, trigger different kind of interesting behavior in different systems. 
for example, it can uh, lead to a rest of phase separation. Okay. So this means that with strong enough language reciprocity, the coarsening of phase field will, will not go all the way up to the system size, but instead it will stop at certain size and this lead to pattern formation. Okay. And depending on the specific setting of the system, this kind of pattern can either be static, it can also be traveling, or oscillatory. And the dynamics of this uh, traveling and oscillatory state have the same physical origin as I just introduced before. Okay. On the other hand, we can also add reaction to, into the system. And this gives much uh, richer dynamics. As you can see here, we have this propagating job list, propagating, um, I don't know what this is, and bands, network, and this uh, job that can spontaneously split and then merge. And also this dancing job day that is traveling also. Okay, and this thunder-like dynamics. In the particle, particle picture, land reciprocity can also give rise to very interesting um, self-assemble behavior. Here we can see that the two type of colloids are interacting land reciprocity. Okay, we can see that there are a lot of self-assemble structures. Each has their own dynamics. And these dynamics are highly related to the symmetry of these structures. Okay, you see this spinning and then oscillating and it is, is even more interesting. Okay. Finally, uh, non reciprocity can also be incorporated in spin systems. And this has been done in this beautiful work in nature that's been recently published. Okay. So there by studying the uh, non-reciprocal interaction of two spins, they, they find that um, there are various type of symmetry breaking they are very similar to what I introduced today. And at high enough than this frosty, the system can in, go into a time periodic state, such as this kind of state, where the two spinners, they are spinning towards the same direction and at a constant speed, okay? There's also a strike phase where the spins, they keep flipping. And this flipping is periodically in time. With that, I'd like to conclude that the understanding of the digital system is an emerging direction that has implications in physics, in biology, in engineering, and also in social science. Thank you all for your attention. Yeah. One touch. Hi, a very interesting talk, thank you. Thank you. I have a few questions. So, uh, I, I, I like your simulations and your theory, but they are not exactly the same. Yeah? So the interaction in the simulations doesn't correspond exactly to the interaction in the theory where you have the cross diffusion term and, and in simulations you have attraction and, and, and repulsion. In particular, in simulations, I notice that uh, the red particles and the blue particles are completely demixed which means that a red particle doesn't feel a gradient of, of, of blue particles. Yeah, so in, in, in your theory, a red particle you know, moves with this cross-diffusion term, which means that if the cross-diffusion term is zero, then, then, then you don't have those interactions. That's a very good uh, observation. Yes, yes, but the red particle, can, can, the red particle at a boundary can also fear this gradient, right? So I think qualitatively they are the same. It's just how the density is distributed in space. And that can be controlled by changing a parameter. It's just it's really difficult to, to set uh, the parameter in a, in, in a particle model in order to have the same behavior. So, yeah. Now, another question. You've shown that, uh, you know, one velocity is larger than the other velocity, yes? And then they move away. Uh, so what's the steady state? I mean, or, or, or the stationary state? We will, you know, so if you have periodic boundary conditions and the velocities continue to be different, then, you know, one, one will make yeah. a complete circle. And that, that's a very good, side. very good observation. Yes, so, so interesting, we find that um, when, when the two, um, let me see if I can find it. 
<laughs> so, uh, okay, so when they become more apart, so this sine theta here, okay, when one fly become larger and larger, actually the non-reciprocity can also tune this ratio, okay, so it effectively slows down A and speed up B, okay, so the speed difference, they would be minimized as they become more separate, and eventually they will become equal speed, and then they travel along the same direction. That's very interesting. My last question. So that solution with equal speeds, in principle, it can coexist with the static state. I mean, so you find the linear instability of the static state, yes? But in, in principle, that solution can be stable also for the parameters where the static state is stable. Have you, have you tried to you know to, to start with this moving solutions, say, in simulations, I don't know, and change the parameters slowly, moving back to... Uh, actually, it cannot. So, it cannot. yeah, if you look at the solution here, there is a condition. So, so you have to have this argument under this, um, under this uh, square root to be non-zero. So you have to have enough data, large enough data to make it positive. Otherwise, this solution doesn't make any sense. Okay. And under such data, this static state already loses the stability. Okay. So, so, so you don't have hysteria? No, no, no. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I can add something in concern to the first question that was asked. So if you write down, you can write down the microscopic dynamics of the particle model and coarse grain the equations. And if the densities are, cons the constant, the density are conserved, you can actually derive uh, diffusive equation of the type that Ji Hong solved. So the two models are in that sense. Uh, the continuum model is a coarse grain version of the particle model. You can actually show that. So you see the attraction and repulsion really they, can, they can lead to cross diffusion terms that are uh, uh, opposite to each other. And, and the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, uh, the initial condition that Ji Hong showed for the system where they was already phase separate is really uh, done to speed up the simulation. Because if you start with a homogeneous state, you first have to get the phase separated state. And then and then you might see these effects. Right? I think, yeah, I think yeah. that's the way I was You do have the same traveling state, even if you start from a homogeneous state. But uh, again, the particle model can be coarse grain. There are techniques for doing this and deriving continuum equations that will be of this type. You have to make some approximations. You actually have to use low density, assume low density, even though the density is not low in the system, but you can see that you derive equation of this type. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. More questions? Uh, it's a very interesting talk. So my question is that uh, you show this uh, dynamical pattern, and in the end, they reach this equal velocity uh, situation. So in, in the intermediate time scale, then supposedly there's some pattern formation where there is some asymmetry. So I'm wondering, have you ever calculated the uh, pair correlation function or structure factor to show when you break the parity symmetry, does the structure factor show any particular features? Uh, I, I didn't, uh, because it's uh, just quite obvious. I mean, you can just look at, see the structure by eye, so I, I didn't calculate. But I'm sure that if you calculate that, you will see, I mean, definitely certain peak in the Fourier space. Right, the, the question the Rina asks is that in a typical uh, scattering problem, there's a parity conservation. That means the peak should be symmetric when you do the uh, inversion. Yeah, and then since you break the parity, then you are, when, when you have equal velocity, your peak should be still symmetric. But then in the intermediate phase, it might be asymmetric, and that might mean something interesting. Yeah, yeah, what definitely. kind of a structure that in, is? In the omega space, if you have a traveling yes. state, then you definitely end up only, with only one side of the omega that right. has peaks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. More questions? Actually, uh, everyone loves you because you just finished in time, but everyone is going to hate me because I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions. 
So uh, one question is, it uh, seems like that you had this mean field equations and you didn't have any noise. I was wondering if the noise is going to change the fate of these phases. But then the simulation was the honest simulation, so I guess the answer is not. You mean the particle simulation or continuous simulation? Yeah, the, the particles, uh, the, the simulation that you did, that was the honest exact simulation. But the effective model that you had, it was sort of the mean field equation without yeah. any noise, right? Yeah. Yeah. So should I conclude that the noise doesn't affect? I think that, that depends. So it depends what, how far you are away from the transition. So I'm not sure what's the effect of noise when you are close to the transition because it, you can, noise can definitely change the transition. But away from that, it should have no. But the noise can also uh, affect the phase itself, right? Uh, sorry? The, the noise, uh, are you saying that the noise can affect the phase transition, but the phase is intact? The phase is the phase with the uh, broken reflection, uh, reflection symmetry. Oh, uh, as strong enough uh, noise, it should be yeah, it should disrupt that kind of state. I think because um, this kind of symmetry breaking, it it kind of relies on the amplitude of this fluctuation. If it's too strong, then you can have parity breaking at some instant, and then it instantly being removed by the noise. And that, uh, but that should uh, depend on the uh, dimension of the system. If the system is really a low dimensional, noise is going to be really detrimental to the phase, right? Or maybe more. So this is the physics that you're seeing is in two dimensions, right? Yeah, yeah. Have you also you can, seen that in one dimension? In one D, it's exactly the same dynamics. I see. Yeah. So maybe yeah, the noise has different effect in different uh, dimensions. Yeah. Okay, no more questions? If not, let's thank Jihan and all the thank speakers. You. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks for sticking around. The first uh, in-person conference after two years is officially concluded. Thank you.